then we'll we'll start from there. Yes, great. Okay, hi everyone. I'm super happy that uh, well everyone made it to our first seminar in 2021, uh, where we'll be having Fabian Michelangeli uh, present. Whatever, I'm actually excited what he will be presenting. <laughs> uh, Fabian is working on, to me it seems like almost every project that's dealing with melastomatase. So I guess if any of you have worked with melastomatase, you know Fabian. Um, he's a curator at the New York Botanical Garden and um, well, has started out working on milestones more in the uh, ant-plant uh, interaction side and recently more focusing on um, systematics and taxonomy, particularly of the megagenus uh, Meconia. And um, well, I think one, one uh, nice story this, that describes, at least the way I know Fabian, is uh, from about a year ago when I was doing field work in Colombia and uh, took some pictures of some melastomes in the field where I did not know what they were. And I sent these pictures to Fabian on WhatsApp. And then Fabian, like two minutes later, he wrote back, Agnes, you must be in Valle del Cauca, there and there, that's where these species grow. And I was like, okay, damn it. I send you two pictures and you know where I am. That's scary. <laughs> but yeah, that's Fabian. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who don't know him yet, I'm sure you'll get to know him pretty soon, like once traveling is allowed again. And then please, Fabian, the floor is yours and go ahead and give an amazing presentation. Well, I don't know if it will be amazing or not, but uh, we'll start, start sharing my screen here uh, and we'll see where we go from, from here. Um, And is that working now? Okay, so um, as Agnes said, I, I have worked on a lot of things and with a lot of you, but, but really I'm responsible of nothing. I'm not in charge of anything big thing. I'm more like touching many projects and there's most of you that do the projects and then I somehow get involved peripherally. So I don't have a lot to talk that is my own personal research. So a lot of what you will see here today is stolen from my former students, postdocs, collaborators, uh, et cetera. So um, I, I wanna talk about something as basic as what we know about plant species distributions. And before that, I need to acknowledge, you know, funding from NSF, APESPI, NASA, and the Botanical Garden, then all the people on this list. They have been with me in the field, in the lab, in the herbarium, um, and especially the first, the top three there, Liz, Melissa, and Kim have uh, helped a lot with the databasing and the maps that I will be showing today and some of the things I will be showing today. And some of this is also part of a lot of discussions we've been having for a Melliston book that we're preparing. Uh, and the first chapter is led by Carmen Ulloa and we've been having some discussions about species diversity and stuff and that's also in there. So, if you're in this uh, call here, I don't need to tell you that melastons are super cool uh, and they are also super diverse. They go from anything from um, this tiny little herb, Macrocentrum droseroides, about three centimeters um, in fluorescence, to lianas, to, to shrubs, to super tall trees um, in the Andes. And then incredible flower morphology. And then um, diversity of fruits between uh, both capsules and, and berries. And this makes the family a really good example or a really good model system to study all sorts of different things. Unfortunately, we also have invasives. Um, I Many of you have seen this slide. I have shown it a few times before. This is from an REI catalog from about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, here they, you have two hikers in, in Hawaii and they are touching Myconia crenata, formerly known as Clydemia hirta. And, and then in the back of the catalog said, oh, get out to the wild and touch places. And unfortunately, this was touched by both Teridium and, and Custer's curse here. My own um, personal tr history with Melastone started, as Agnes said, with um, 
and plants. And, and my original idea, I came from a more ecological background. This is half a lifetime away ago, like over 25 years ago. And I was looking at the evolution of these ant plant associations. And one of the first problems that I had is that I could not figure out what the species were, um, what, how many species were there, where they grow. There was very, the, the information was all very disparate. Um, and, and, and then, you know, that sort of basic question of what is, uh, this is of how many species are in a given place, how many species belong to a given group, how are the species distributed and how are they related to each other? 25 years ago, a lot of that was not known. And, and um, we're starting to come a long way, but still today, a lot of that is not easily uh, as easy to answer. So the first you know, family phylogeny was published about 20, 21 years ago by uh, Gudrun uh, Klausing, now Catarite and Susan Renner. And, and we've come a, a long way from then. And here we have Marcelo's uh, last phylogeny with over, over, over 1300 species uh, throughout the family uh, with Sanger sequencing. And now there is one in review, um, part of the big Q PAFTOL project that includes four melastomes, um, the 353 uh, angiosperm data set um, uh, with over 150 species of, of, of melastomes. Um, they, um, there, there is also, you know, Darren Pennies is working on, a, on a, another phylogeny that's coming and uh, Lucas Majur is leading a, a project to uh, expand um, next generation sequencing uh, at a complete family level. So the phylogenetic um, part or, or, or our phylogenetic knowledge keeps growing, but um, that doesn't mean that floristics, that we're done doing floristics, and that's what really what I want to concentrate on today. Um, so how many species of Melastomastasia are there and where, they are, where are they found? So, you know, this is kind of funny because when I was writing uh, uh, introduction for a paper in not, not long ago, I came up with three different numbers and actually one of the reviewers said, well, I never saw that number, that number is too high. And another reviewer said, I never saw that number, that number is too low. So we, and this was very recent. So it's like, even the number of species in the family is something that we don't uh, have a good handle on. So to do that, we need to go out into the field, like Humboldt and Bonplan did, we still have to do that. And, and it's maybe, uh, uh, important to explain what is the rate relationship of field work to um, how we know the number of species. So here we have Humboldt as depicted by Weish uh, pressing a plant in his uh, trip in the early 1800s to South America. Incidentally, this is uh, Mariania speciosa. Um, if you want to know more about that, it's, there's some little write-ups about that. But so we collect the plants and then once we collect the plants, uh, we can come up with a list of plants for a given place, a catalog. And then if we have a lot more data, we can actually create a flora for a given place. That's great. And then if we have a lot of data for a given group, we produce a monograph so far. And then the monograph can inform the catalog on the flora as well. So now I go to the field and collect yet another plant. And I don't know quite what it is. And I start looking at the, at the monographs, the catalogs, the list, and I figure I decide that that's not um, anything that I, that I see before. And then it gets published as a new species. And rinse and repeat. Uh, we do this process many, many times. And, and that those new species that get described then inform the monographs, the floras, and the catalogs again. And that specimen now be, becomes part of our knowledge. Um, so if we start looking at that and, and what we know for the neotropics, th there have been floras um, 
written for lots of for uh, some places, but not for every country. So Central America, Frank produced it for Flora, Flora Miso in 2010, for example, or um, uh, Alain published one for the Dominican Republic in 2000 and so forth. There are lots of regional floras for smaller places, but interestingly, some large countries like Colombia uh, and Bolivia haven't had a flora in a long, long time. I mean, there were some in the 19th century. Uh, and Brazil, well, Brazil is a special case because um, there was Cognos flora and nothing really since until now, which we have the Flora Brazil 2020. However, there are catalogs for a lot of other places, and those are the ones here in white. And even a place like Peru that had a catalog in the 40s, I mean, a flora in the 40s has a catalog now in the 90s, and then even an update in the 2000s. So it's interesting to put on top of this how many species we, we have for different places. And the first number you see in every pair here is the number, total number of species. And the other thing, the second number we see is the number of species described in the last 20 years. And we see that there are still a lot of species being described. And, and if we look a little bit more carefully, there's an interesting pattern. Places where the foras were done a while back, like, like 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, like Guyana and Venezuela have very few new species being described in the last 20 years. But the places where there's an there's a lot of activity going on right now. So the checklist for Colombia, uh, the flora of Brazil 2020, look at the number of species published in the last 20 years. And this is no coincidence. If you we go back to the previous um, slide, we'll remember that as you know, floras get um, produced and, and catalogs get produced, we're looking more and more at those specimens and that spurs the publication of new species. And in fact, um, there, it's a, there's a very clear pattern that um, the new species descriptions usually spike in the five years immediately preceding and immediately after the publication of a checklist or a flora. And, and so what that means is that the, 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 a lot of species get published because you're preparing that checklist or that flora. And then once that is published, a lot of things that people had hidden uh, in, their, in, their, in the herbaria, in their cabinets, they go like, oh, let me try to determine that now that the flora is out. It immediately spurs the publication of additional things. So floras are obsolete the moment they get published, but that it's part of the natural process. Another thing that is interesting is as we talk about field work is that it's becoming very, very different. So this is a Axinea purpurea, um, you know, what is now Mariana Radula collected by recent Pavon over 230 years ago in Peru. And we don't even have a date, a precise date or a precise locality in this specimen. And this is the same species collected much more recently. And then you see a lot more data associated with that specimen, which allows us to do a lot more, um, understand more about the distribution of the species. And it's not only um, the, the specimen we're collecting, but we're collecting now uh, material for anatomy, for uh, uh, electron microscopy. We're taking fo photographs in the field and uh, the data to, to do you know, DNA extractions or, or silica to preserve material to do the, DNA, the DNA extractions. Not only are we collecting differently, but we are taking even those old specimens and trying to figure out exactly where they are and, and there is now all this digitization that's going on, that is, is in a large amount of data that is becoming available. Um, so for the New York Botanical Garden, for example, we have about um, 78,000 specimens of uh, Melastomataceae. Of those 78,000 specimens, about 49,000 now have uh, lat, lat, lat longitude, no, you know, georeference data on them. And this is where they come from. In you know, this is the collection density that we have at the New York Botanical Garden. And then if we compare that to the species density, we see where there are more, spe more, more species. The redder the color, the more species we have here. So the Andes, the Guyana Highlands, the Atlantic Rainforest, and the Cerro Espinazo here. Lots and lots 
of species. And of course, um, there is a correlation between the number of spe the species, the specimens we have, and the number of specimens. And eventually, that curve will um, sort of flatten out. But th and there are some places where we have lots and lots of specimens, uh, but not as many species. And you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that these places here that are under the curve tend to be very close to biological stations. So Barro Colorado Island, La Selva Biological Station, um, some places very close universities um, in, in Colombia and in, in Cuba, they, they, they fall in this cloud of things. But the more interesting places are those that are above the curve. The places that we have a lot of specimens and probably we haven't hit that saturation uh, yet. So there are more species there to be discovered. So one of those places that, I, that is on the curve that even though has a lot of specimens collected is right here in central Peru. And that's the Parque Nacional Yanachaga Chemillan. And this is a particularly interesting place because the eastern part of the park is completely Amazonian. It's at about 350 meters above sea level. And then the western part of the park is up on the, this little branch of the Andes that goes up to about 3,500 meters. Uh, and up here gets closer to 4,000 meters and even has a road that goes through the park. So that makes it ideal to collect and understand. So this area was first, like the first intensive collecting in this area happened in the 1980s by uh, Robin Foster and other folks from the Field Museum. And based on that, Wurdak described immediately five new species. And as time has gone by, if we looked at the number of species that we can record from there, it has steadily grown. And then in um, the early 2000s, the Missouri Botanical Garden established a herbarium in Oxapampa, right at the edge of the park. And the number of specimens shot through the roof. And now the number of new species uh, keeps on growing. And for a small park that has, you know, relatively small park, we have over 250 species of Malastomatesi in one place. And this is fascinating. Um, of course, that, that um, breadth of um, environment is, is important. And maybe I, I should tell a story of a couple of those species, of those new species that we're describing from this area. So one of them is this uh, Miconia florbella. The plant was first collected uh, in the 1930s. And, and there are, have been lots of specimens um, from central Peru, from um, a, 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 throughout the 20th century. And it was photographed for the first time and he, uh, probably in the 1980s. Here's a picture by Robin Foster in 1980. And then it was included in an unpublished thesis um, in the 90s as a new genus actually uh, back then. And then finally, Renato Goldenberg and I went after it. We, we, we knew this was an interesting thing. We really wanted to collect it. And there were other things in the group that we were interested in. And we ended up um, revising this little group and finally publishing it. So from the time that it was first collected to, to the time that it was described, it's you know almost 90 years. So it's a long time for a plant to come out to life. Um, and this is, you know, this thing is about two meters tall with this very bright picture of uh, flowers and is colonized by ants. So it has, all, you would think that something that is so obvious would have been collected before and, and will, or described before and we'll go more in detail on, the, on why that happens. But another interesting thing is that while we were there trying to find this one plant, literally two meters away from it, we found this other one. <laughs> It also with hollow stems, also with ants, but very different flowers, uh, probably put, um, much smaller, you know, with this wing hypanthia. So, and this plant had not really been collected until, but until the last 10 years. So one was collected 90 years ago and one only in the last 10 years, two new species from the same place. This pattern of going after things and, and finding new things because you have a trained eye, it doesn't only, is limited not only to new species, 
but it also uh, happens if you're for new records. So uh, for example, in the state of Acre, the, the, the first checklist in the late 90s had about 90 species of melastomes, but after Renato went there and just by looking at the plants of the herbarium, he shot to 120 with the description of only a couple of new ones. And, and Diego uh, Paredes started the uh, checklist or a, a flora of, for, the, for the state of Pura and other Peru. And, and he went from less than four, around 40 species to close to 90 and then 12 new records for the country and stuff. So it's, this, it's not only about new species, but new records. And it's not only about, you know, when you do it at a geographic scale, but this also can happen when you are focusing on a particular group. And, and Lucas, I'm sure we'll talk more about this. So I'm not gonna, not gonna steal much of his thunder, but you know, Andrea Maureen uh, started looking at this group and then Lucas and Renato and, and I more closely. And what, there is a monograph for this group. It was record that had 19 species in 1989 and they were mostly concentrated in the South, you know, Rio de Janeiro to uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. But through Renato's and, and Andrea Marin's collecting efforts and then later Lucas's efforts, the number of specimens shot up, especially in the Northern part of the, the Atlantic rainforest. And now we, instead of having 90 species, there are 33 species. And we, and we have these areas in the North of the Atlantic forest that have a lot more species in any one given area than in the South. So our knowledge of the South improved, but much more up here. And it's not only about where the species are, but then characters that were considered rare, for example, uh, Bertolonia with alternate leaves. Now there are a lot of you know, more species of these 33 that have that character. There was only two species with pink flowers that were known before. Most of them were white. Now we have a lot more pink flowers. So as time, um, as new things accumulate, we have a better, not only understanding of the distribution, but also of the character variation. So, uh, so if we look again at, at this accumulation curve and we look at the distribution, um, we see that there are many areas that where we haven't collected. And we also see um, that they, we also need to take into consideration um, that some plants, especially Amazonian things, have wide distribution, but lots of plants are found in only one of those little squares. And there are many ways that we can uh, look at the range. We can estimate the total range. We can um, go with the, the official IUCN's uh, ranges. But here I'm just looking at uh, how many of those grids have um, are occupied by a given species. So we go from Tococa guianensis and Myconia crenata all the way down and very quickly, most species are present, have been recorded in only one, two or three of those squares. So for 30, over 3,700 species in the Neotropics, really this is a long tail distribution with very few species um, collected in, in, in a long, in a broad, uh, or in a or, or or in a lot in a lot of places. The other thing that is interesting is that if we look at those 400 species that have been described in the last um, 20 years, some do have um, long, uh, you know, broad ranges. Miconia nordestina is probably the one that has the most, uh, the the largest range of all the species described in the last 20 years. But, and, and here's Miconia nei that also turned out to have a, a nice range. But the great majority of species described in the last 20 years are known from very few places. So if we go back to this map and we start to think about that, um, and so we, we know that the Amazonian species tend to be a little bit more distributed and the Andean species, not so much. And then, so we have to make a decision whether to collect here or here, well, maybe maybe this spot here will be better than here because the species here are more likely to be around it already, but species here, who knows? Uh, but more interesting is maybe a place like this 
that is in a hole and even around it is not that many uh, specimens collected. So that might be more interesting even like this. And, and I can make this um, you know, con conjecture of whether this is worth doing or not. And there was a spot that didn't have many collections. It didn't look, it wasn't empty, but it was like a light yellow 15 years ago where, as I said, in Southern Bahia, there, a lot of more collections started happening. And then uh, we went in particular to this one place, Estasao Ecologica Estadual, the one Estado Guimarães in Southern Bahia. It's, it's a very small preserve. And we went there because we knew of one species that might have been new. And literally, it, 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 the place is so small, you, you only need two or three days there. Um, we published very quickly four new species from four different tribes uh, in, in, in this spot. Uh, and and it, it wasn't like as much work as it would have been in, in um, when we were in Jana Chaga Chemillen because it's a much more concentrated. And now one of these species is Mariania inflata here. And, and this species has a very weird morphology, it has very weird anthers, different, uh, um, uh, more flower morphology in most things in the genus. And, and this is not a, only about collecting new species, but Agnes um, included this species in one of her stud on, in her studies. And we can see this species is this one right here. And you can see that it has a morphology that is really, it, it is, is different to, to collect a, a plant that falls out of it by itself then collect one of these that there are many things that are similar. So we are filling that morpho space by finding these new species. And that's, um, if we didn't have it, we, would then, we, couldn't, we wouldn't know that this possibility existed. So it's in, that's another important part of, of this documentation of um, biodiversity. So to give you an idea, in the last 15 years, four new genera are neotropical milestones um, have been described based on fairly new uh, collections. So, and, and not only these are four new genera, but they are also, they, incredibly, they occupy positions that are in the phylogeny that are quite unique. This Kipuantus epipetricus, that is two populations, one in central Ecuador and one in Northern Peru, 650 kilometers apart, but definitely the same species. It's in the, it's, in the tribe Cyphostili, doesn't match anything else in the tribe. Um, and perhaps the more inter one of the most interesting cases is this genus Fisiterostemon from Southern Bahia that had never been collected 20 years ago. And now not only we have a new genus, it has five new species. They're all fairly different. Uh, and not only they are different among themselves and it's a new genus, but it's sister. This is in the group that is sister to all milestones. So, if we didn't have this group, what we would know, I mean, not to almost, I'm sorry, to Myconia. So this group of five species plus one other, Ariognema and one other um, are, so a group of seven species sister to 1900. If we didn't have these five species, our interpretation could be completely different of that phylogeny. So, um, between 2009 and 2018, we had funding for this project, the PBI, and uh, which was the Planetary Biodiversity Inventory of Myconi. And as part, as part of that project, over 125 species of milestones were described. And you know, these ones in, in yellow, we collected. The ones in blue, uh, we found in the herbarium when we were trying to determine the ones in yellow or other things. But an interesting thing that happened here that started to happen was we had colleagues that knew that we were working in these groups uh, and would you know, contact Frank or contact Walter or contact me or Renato and say, hey, can you help with this? And those are the green ones. So you see that they, this systematics and taxonomic work is not only starting to change to what it was um, 60 and 70 years ago. If we go back to the 1940s, it was only uh, Gleason publishing species by himself. If we go to the 50s and 60s, it was Wurdak. And it wasn't really until Frank and Walter started to come in that we started to see a more um, 
diversity or more variety of names of people. And now we see teams of people publishing together. So part of this is also um, all informed now with um, phylogenetic work, not at, a, at the family level that, that we were talking about, but at more specific levels uh, of, of genera uh, or tribes or even species complexes. And that is starting to also modify what we know of the, the, the limitations of these groups. But why are mono, so I've been talking mostly about floristic work, but why is monographic work also important? It's because the flora tells you everything there is in a spot, but the monograph, it tells you everything there is to know about a group. And if you don't look at a group in its totality, you might miss a lot of things. And, and for example, here we have Myconia thesans, th this particular one is in, in Venezuela, but if we look at what we have in our phylogeny, we start to see that these things are starting to come in different aspects in uh, different points in the tree. They're all sort of closely related, but they're not, they're probably not the same thing. And we have things in Brazil, in, in Guyana, in Costa Rica, in Colombia, in Venezuela. And for example, some of them I have collected and they have a very distinctive smell, others do not. Some have nectar, others do not. And if we don't evaluate this in a monographic context and in a phylogenetic context, we're not gonna know that. So we have different species under one name. The other thing also happens. So there's this plant, that's a little shrub along, very common along creeks in Central America, and Northern South America. If you're in South America, you used to call it Leandra subseriata. If you were in Central America, Leandra melanodesma, which is now Myconia subseriata. This is the same thing. And the same thing happens if we look at this species, Myconia umbellata, across the Greater Antilles. Three, it, has, it was recognized as under different names, but it's obviously the same species as Walter um, showed very clearly in the monograph for this group. So a monograph is important to understand the, the species in a, in a more global uh, way. So, Monographs, so I've been talking a lot about how many new species we have described, but monographs also cause species to be lost. And that is not a problem. That actually is good. That is, a, we're advancing. We know, we have to remember that when a new species is only um, uh, hypothesis, that these things all belong together. And we can prove the hypothesis or we can refute that hypothesis. So as monographs get published, things get synonymized. This happens, but that's okay. So the, I said about 450 new species in the last 20 years, uh, my rough count, and this is not as precise as that 450 figure, but my rough count is that about 160 species, uh, species names have been synonymized in the last 20 years. So net gain of 300, not so bad. So going back to Marcelo's phylogeny here, um, uh, family phylogeny, these bars represent um, the distribution of the species. And you can see here the trend that, you know, there are things that are widely distributed and lots of things that are not so widely distributed. Most of these things here are Amazonian. You can see here, lots of things widely distributed. These Andean and Caribbean clades, not so many things widely distributed. So one of the things that, and then here in pink, I have Mark, the groups that have been monographed in the last 30 years or so. Um, and the monographs that we have represent less than 18% of the family. And no monograph has contained more than 90 species. Uh, and only really, only two have more than 60. Um, and the other thing that we notice from this exercise is that the species with broader distributions are overrepresented in the phylogeny. Or if you want to see it in the other way, rare things are not so represented in the phylogeny. Things that are microendemic, you have to go to every one single place to collect them to be able to represent them in the phylogeny. And that hasn't really quite happened. So hopefully, the project led by Lucas that will be able to use more herbarium specimen data will allow us to get more of a, a good idea of this micro endemics. So one, one um, uh, consequence of all of this uh, phylogenetic work is that the cis of every group 
but the subfamily, all these VOED and the tribe Kibesi has changed in the last 15 years. Every, like the Myconi, the Sonorilli, the, every single group, the Melastoma, the Melastomi, they all have changed. And in the neotropics, the taxonomic situation is such that uh, almost one third of all neotropical species have changed genera in the last 10 years or 11 years. So there is a lot of, of change happening. But again, th this is how science advances. And they, they, in the neotropics, the process is more advanced, but this is starting to happen also in the old world with but more group work starting to come out of both Africa and Asia. So finally, how many species of melastomes are there? Well, the number I have to give you today, and that's the number today, and it won't be the same tomorrow. Actually, I should change it because there's a species that got published today in Phytotaxa. Uh, I just saw it earlier today. So maybe I should put a five here, um, but it's 5,744 species. And I think this is notable because no, no publication I ever seen had more than 5,300. So this is, you know, 15% increase over what we have. And, and you know, we have about 3,700 species in the neotropics, about 320 species each in continental Africa and in Madagascar, and about 1,350 species in Asia. Now, the quality of our knowledge is not equal across. Uh, I would say, you know, three out of five stars for the neotropics, lots of phylogenies, but large groups like Microlisi, Blackie, and Myconi don't have uh, monographs, and that's a problem. And, and because so many of the species are microendemic, we have lots of place to go to. Um, Africa, I also give it three stars, but for different reasons. It's because the uh, density of collections is a lot lower. So we don't know as much uh, about the distribution of individual species. Um, and and uh, I think there's a lot still to be done there. Although for the species we have, we many most of them have been included in phylogenies and that's a, a different aspect. Madagascar, very good list, very, we know a lot, but many, many species still to be uh, published probably, especially in all these you know, thanks to Doug Stone and in other groups. And, and even though we know well what go, grows there, very few things have included in global phylogenies. And then, and then Asia, definitely it's our black hole. And, and part of the problem with Asia is that th there are very few countrywide checklists or, um, or, 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 and, or, and there are very, and all, very few genera of Asia have been monographed. And then many of the species in Asia are in the tribes on really, you know, close to two thirds of those are in the tribes on really. And there is the, the taxonomy of Sonorilli really, uh, is anything from one genus to 50. <laughs> so we'll see. So uh, I'm, I don't have a map like this for Asia yet, but this is a map for the Americas and Africa. And we can see, you know, most of this, lots of species in, um, in Brazil, you know, over 1400 species, 65% of them are, are endemic. Um, in the, the Andean countries, you know, around between a quarter and a third of the species for any given country are endemic for those countries. And then as we go uh, more to more subtropical areas, the number of species declines, but not necessarily the number of endemics. And the reason is because the geological history of South America and Central America and the Antilles is so complex that you have lots of microhabitats, lots of areas that have been isolated and put back together. And, and you know, the Greater Antilles, almost 90% of the species present in the Greater Antilles are, um, are endemic. And in fact, uh, over three quarters of the species in the greater Antilles are single island endemics. In Africa, um, the, most of the endemic species are in, in the more tropical uh, areas. And then as we get up, up towards the edge of the distribution, not as many uh, endemics with South Africa, uh, an, ex an exception. And then from the tribe's point of view, the colors here to represent the different continents and, you know, we see that most groups are either restricted or mostly restricted to a continent 
with Sonorelli and Malastomi, uh, uh, Tommy, the, the exceptions, they, the NLDs BOID, all widely distributed. So um, herbaria are, many of you have seen this paper, you know, we know that they contain a lot of specimens. And the, uh, and the average time for a species to be described from the day that it was first collected is 30 years. Uh, so they have estimated that over half the species have yet to be collected. And I mentioned that close to 450 species of neotropical melastomes have been described in the last 20 years, but how many more to come? Well, we're here stuck with COVID, so the herbarium is what we have. And at New York Botanical Garden, we have lots of uh, undetermined things to, that are just to genus. So for example, this is just Myconia sensu cognio, sensu strictissimo, uh, the number of specimens we have and how many are in that. Look, Missouri, 10,000 specimens, uh, almost uh, 8,500 8, specimens of Myconia sp. New York, uh, 5,000 specimens of Myconia sp. So how many of these are things that are well known and widely distributed? How many of these are things that fall on this part of the curve are not new species, but they are rare. So if you put in front of me Myconia calvescens, I can tell you immediately, okay, Myconia calvescens. Takes me one second to decide that it's Myconia calvescens and five seconds to write the name with authority. But if you put something that is grown in only one little you know, mountain range in, in Southern Bolivia, it's gonna take me a half a day to put a name there. And how I know that that's new, that is something that is known and rare or that is a new species. I don't know. And that's, uh, as a herbarium curator, a lot of my time is spent trying to put names to these things. And also th these things, because honestly, the majority of the specimens that come through the herbarium are these, and it still takes time to put that name down. So, um, there's lots of people that are starting to think of, about these issues. Um, and the, uh, some of my colleagues at the garden are starting to, to take advantage of the fact that, that we have digitized uh, every specimen of melastoma in New York. And we started, uh, we team up with people at Cornell Tech and, and Google, and we submitted all of this as a data set for a AI competition on species, on, on uh, image, artificial intelligence and and these folks they, they were able to they, through the competition they created these models that can identify about eight of the specimens about uh, species sorry about 84 percent of the time accurately so that was with, with a first pass and now we're trying to refine this and to so so we have a better than 84 percent and and the important part here is not to identify the, um, the common things, but to flag the things, those things that the, the models cannot fit to, a, they say, well, they, they, the model always give you a, a, an answer, but they will tell you whether they is confident or not on the answer. And those are the ones that we wanna focus on for many reasons. This allows me to say, oh, I know that uh, so-and-so is working in this group in Mexico and I can forward those images to that person in Mexico. Or I can, it's much easier for me for those species that are new, not new, but are fairly rare or not so common. It's easier for me to look at the name and say, yes, that is that. That takes a lot less time than to try to put a name for a rare thing. And that then frees us time to go and, and find a new species and also flags the specimens that are potentially interesting. So we're now in a second phase of this project trying to develop a tool that will flag those specimens and stay tuned. And that might be another talk that I, I would like to give here when we have this working. So just to finish, you know, field work and collections are essential for evolutionary biology because without them, we cannot produce monographs that tell us what things are. And those are essential for evolutionary biology. They're obsolete the moment they're published, but that's okay. And we need more tools to aid in identification and species management. So please get out there and start collecting. Thank you.
Thanks now for time for questions. That was really great. Yes. Feel free to either um, put your questions in the chat or or raise your hand. So I, I, I think I allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So I think that should work if you have a question. Well, if not, I'm going to shoot the first one at you, Fabian. Where will you go first, knowing where are the biggest gaps? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, Colombia is still uh, one of the countries where uh, there's the most amount of work to do because for so long it was so difficult to get into some places um, that due to you know safety issues and whatnot, and it doesn't have a flora. And the fact that it doesn't have a flora, it's, it's you go to the herbarium in, in Bogota or in Cali, and the amount of undetermined things is scary. Um, and then there are some areas in central Peru that are very remote uh, that that nobody has really gotten to yet. Um, but but as I think you can see from you know even a place that you would think oh we know everything you know Cuba is an island well that species are still being described there and something I didn't mention uh, I had it included in the talk but then took out is things that ha have been collected and were collected 50 80 90 years ago and then never collected again we don't have these things in the phylogeny and I think it's important for us to know whether they're extinct or whether they are there but just rare and and uh, that that is not it's another issue but yeah so I, I think Colombia and northern Peru are the two areas that offer the most um, promise I do have permits for Peru so at the moment I'm allowed to travel <laughs> I'm on the plane what about Venezuela which has been more or less isolated out of or for political reasons now for longer I mean yeah you know well, if I talk about Venezuela we'll cry okay then let's not it's, it's, you know I, I, I can't. I yeah, can't. Fair enough. <laughs> Someone ask a question now, please. <laughs> yeah, there's one. What are your thoughts now about the processes driving this diversification? Ooh. So I think there are many things happening and, and they're happening at a, a, a different thing. So they, of course, they, in South America, at least, they, uh, the uplift of the Andes was, and was critical. The um, uh, creation of a semi deciduous or sem dry corridor in, in the um, Campos Rupestres in Brazil was critical. The Atlantic Forest, all of these areas that are isolated. So, isolation one. Number two, you know, you get on, um, within Myconi, you don't have a lot of um, uh, anthropomorphology. I mean, compared to other things. There is a lot of anthropomorphology diversity, but not as much as in other parts of the family. But you start to see there is apomixes, there is daisy, there is um, uh, a lot more variety of, of, um, uh, of habits. You know, Mariani is not that large a group, but the flowers go from three millimeters to 12 to, you know, that big, nine centimeters. So, so I think that each group will have a slightly different story. In Asia, of course, the, the geology is a huge factor. Um, and, and for Africa, I think um, the, the opening of the savannas and, and, and the, the dynamic movement of savannas and forests has been very important. And in fact, Mary Claire Varanzo and her collaborators have shown that already. So, so it, it, I think every group will be a little bit different. Renato, I think it should work now. Whoop, stopped again. We, no, sorry, we can't hear you now. Now it should hey, work. Renato, go ahead. Uh, I would like to extend my question. It's similar to the one that Agnes made, which is uh, to which herbarium and where in each herbarium would you like to mine things? Like, would you, where do you think are the 
most interesting interesting things to see in uh, in which herbarium and which groups inside each herbarium? Oof. So I, I mean, so one of the things that happen is has happened is that many herbaria are digit large herbaria are digitizing and putting things out. And, and then we can look at the specimens and we can ask for loans and things, but there are lots of small and, re and regional herbaria that are not digitized and contain, the, the people from those local herbaria know where the cool plants are. So um, one example is Sepec. You know, they, they've been collecting in Southern Bahia, they knew what places in Southern Bahia were interesting. And that's how we found out about Wenceslao Guimaraes. Not, all of, not every place in Soria Bahia will have that diversity of new things in one trip. But I think it's, it's the, the knowledge of those, um, those regional herbaria is very important. The other thing is, is to try to think, you know, places that, it, this might sound counterintuitive, but places like the Smithsonian where uh, Wurdak received a lot of things, or you and I receive a lot of things. Well, those things, we're seeing them, we're putting names and so forth. But there are large herbaria like Cali, like um, um, they, it, like some places in Bolivia that haven't had a, a melastome specialist ever go there. So the, the herbarium in La Paz, I don't think a, a herbarium a, 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 like a broad I mean, the people, Suzanne Renner was there several times, but he was working on some specific projects. And since Suzanne went, I don't think anybody has really gone again in the last 18 years or so. So those are barriers that have not been touched by, uh, by specialists. Those are ripe for cool things to, to happen. Long answer for a short question. <laughs> there was another question by uh, Chanel before, whether AI, is this automatic imaging? No, uh, artificial render... intelligence. Oh, artificial intelligence. Okay, render taxonomists obsolete. Ah, I love that question. No, because as I said at some point, these are you know hy um, a species is a hypothesis. So you still need us to a decide that these things are truly different. You still need the person to know where to go to get the things. You still to know need the person to look at the characters. So the, the way I can compare this, I went to a spot in uh, Guyana, in Suriname, sorry, a few years ago with my student, um, Juliana Aguirre. We literally flew to Paramaribo and the next day flew to a spot in, in central Suriname. And that very day, grab a helicopter and we're on top of the mountain. So it took us, 40 hours from Manhattan to the top of the mountain. Um, Bassett McGuire, who worked in the Urban Botanical Garden, went to that spot in 1944. And during the war, he had to take a boat from New York to Havana, another boat from Havana to Paramaribo, then by boat to the base of the Tepuy, and then a one week hike to the top of the Tepuy. So that was a almost one month trip to just start to where he was going to collect the plants. That took me two days. So in a way, I was much more efficient to start working. So that's why I see AI here, is, is improving our efficiencies, is, is making, it's getting us to that point. If I have to spend a full day writing, you know, Myconia albicans, Myconia albicans, Myconia albicans, that's time I don't have to look at the rare things. So that's where I think AI is it's, it's a good thing. And then another question, uh, could you monograph a group based on digital images? No, <laughs> sure, in, sure answer, no. <laughs> uh, you, you see, I mean, in Malastones or in almost any group, I think I, you need to look at characters that are much smaller than current imaging technology allows. Uh, maybe, you know, 20 years from now, it will be different. And then the follow-up question, then why bother? <laughs> well, I mean, Manuel, I mean, he should know better. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I think that um, the, the, you, you cannot monograph it just based on, on, on digital images because of 
the you need to look at other characters. You need to do the dissections. You cannot do that just with digital images. And again, this where they, you know, you cannot do a phylogeny with the digital images. So having the specimen in your hand is important. Is important. But then the, I mean, the algorithms that you're trying that you presented, where you said you get it around eighty percent of accuracy of correct classification. Does this only apply to very common species where you have enough specimens to train the models on? So it's very interesting. So that that um, particular data set is a real life data set that has a very long tail. And the, the first uh, competition we had, we cut it off at 20 specimens. So they could use, there were 15 for the training the model, three for verification and two that were in the data set for quality control. But we have been able, it, it, they, they, this, AI herbarium specimen competitions, they, they are all the way down to five specimens now. So that also allows for a lot more specimens to go in. So the problem with common species, yes, you have a lot more species as uh, specimens, but also you have a lot more variability. Yeah. And, and, and it's, um, th th there are some issues there. And I don't think that yet we have, we're not there yet, uh, but um, the, Maybe, maybe the important part is, 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 is not to put the name. Yes, the, the taxonomy is comes obsolete, but once you have the name, then the important thing is what you do with that knowledge for conservation, for understanding evolution, et cetera. Um, then there was another question about Asia, why we know so little about uh, species there and uh, our own knowledge, knowledge gap in part due to the lack of local interest? Uh, no, actually, there is good inter local interest. Um, but I think the, um, you know, there are a lot more countries involved in the situation. And then there's a, it, it's a, in a way more complex area to, to get around, to move. Um, polit geopolitics take, you know, come into account. Also, you know, even if you, we go to the classic works of Cognio and Triana, they had a lot more access to specimens that were coming from the Americas that from Asian species. So even from a historical point of view, we have had a, a new world and even an Africa bias compared to, to Asia. And, and in more recent times, almost no material gets out of India. And, and, and that's, you know, very little has gotten out of Indonesia. So the, the permit situations there. So, uh, you know, there, there are, it's not one reason I think, but, but there, there is local interest and there, there are very good botanists that work in, in Malastum, uh, Asian Malastums. It's just that we need more. <laughs> okay. Well, if there are no more, immediate questions, then I guess we are at an hour. It's about our time, right? So yeah, thanks Fabiana for a great talk. It was really cool. And I hope these maps make it into the book. <laughs> a better, a, a prettier version. Okay. <laughs> well, congrats, it was really cool. And next time it's Lucas up talking, I assume, yes. <laughs> Great. And yeah, as Fabian said before, please, anyone who wants to give a talk, please come approach us. Don't be shy. We need more people who are willing to talk because there's been someone who said we should have this bi-weekly, but if not more people volunteer for talking, then um, I guess we can. <laughs> and also, we're, 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 it's great if people want to talk about projects, ideas. How do I go about testing this? this is, that's totally fine. Okay? It's not about finished products. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Everyone. <laughs> now I can sleep. Bye.